So in the last part of um, kind of the section in this series of videos, uh, we're gonna just summarize this procedure for our, you know, solving the heat, uh, the heat equation with homogeneous boundary conditions and the, and the given initial condition. Um, we're gonna summarize kind of the procedure that we talked through and then give an explicit example. Um, so for the PDE, where we have, right, heat equation, boundary conditions, and initial condition, um, how do we construct a solution U? So in practice, what we do is we say, okay, well, first we wanna make sure the PDE that we care about is linear. In this case, it is. We wanna make sure that it's homogeneous. You know, here, the, I've written the boundary conditions, but in general, you might have a source term here that might get, get in the way of homogeneity, but we, we wanna make sure we're working with a linear homogeneous um, PDE. In this case, we are. Next, we separate variables. We go through the process of right, writing kind of U is equal to phi times G, figuring out these building blocks, um, which for the heat equation, the building blocks are going to look like this. Um, and then we compute kind of what these coefficients are uh, using the initial condition. And here we'd use a formula, um, kind of these coefficients are equal to two over L or one over um, half the, the interval length. Um, times this integral, which we can think of as the inner product between function we care about and each of our basis functions. Um, so maybe to kind of clarify that. So one way of, maybe another way of writing this is one over half the length of the integral or interval times the inner product of F, maybe I can write F of X, the inner product of f with the function sine of n pi over l. Um, this thing right here is just another notation for this thing. Um, so yeah, then we compute the b sub n and then we have our solution. Okay. So this procedure was kind of specific for these boundary conditions, right? In particular, because this is what the spatial piece looked like. Um, now in general, right? Especially if you don't have homogeneous boundary conditions or if one of your boundary conditions involves a derivative um, or kind of a prescribed flux instead of a prescribed temperature, what we can do is still work with this whole formulation Right, separate variables, figuring out these, figure out these building blocks. It's just now instead of phi sub n being a sine function, um, phi sub n is just going to be generally one of these eigenfunctions, right? So phi sub n satisfies this ODE. Lambda n also satisfies this ODE, where um, phi sub n satisfies the boundary conditions. And so, um, right, as maybe one example, we could have like, um, no, so here, so one example would be instead of the temperature, we have the derivative is equal to zero. And then maybe we have the derivative at the other endpoint is equal to zero, or we could have right derivative at one endpoint is zero, and then the value at the other endpoint is maybe zero, something like that. We need some sort of boundary conditions. Usually, we like them to be homogeneous. Okay. So in general, right, we can construct the solution with these building blocks. Now the change is that phi right here satisfies this ODE with whatever other boundary conditions we're imposing, not necessarily zero temperature. Okay. Um, just a slight generalization or variation. Um, 
But once we know what these feasts of n are, once we compute the solutions to this, then we can figure out what these beasts of n are by essentially the same manner. Okay, so it's a little more involved, right? But one way we can write this is one over the norm of phi sub n, I guess the norm squared, but whatever, times the projection of f of x onto this function phi of x, phi sub n of x. And that's going to be b sub n. Okay. So writing it out like this is kind of the linear algebraic formulation. Writing it out like this is kind of the more computational. Um, but one thing to note is that, so this requires, uh, this requires phi sub n, the inner product of phi sub n with phi sub m equal to zero, or equivalently, the integral from zero to L of phi sub n of x, phi sub m of x dx. This integral is equal to zero if um, n and m are different. Okay, because that was the that was a thing we used in isolating b sub m in that derivation above, right? Sine of um, n pi over l times x. Uh, so the the integral of sine of n n pi over l times x times sine of m pi over l x. That integral is zero if n and m are different. We want that same condition in general for whatever these functions phi are. Okay. Um, yeah, but in our cases, right, if we have zero temperature, this is the form we're going to work with. And these are how we compute the solution or the, the coefficients. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's see an example. It's a little more interesting. It's not just, you know, the initial condition is a sine function. Um, so here the PDE is again going to be the heat equation. Boundary conditions are going to be zero, zero temperature. And now the initial condition is going to be a constant. Okay. Um, so one thing to note right away is that this initial condition, right, say at zero and L, this initial condition is not equal to um, zero. Right, so say so u of zero, zero, that's equal to 100, which is not equal to zero, which we might want u of zero, zero to equal zero coming from the boundary condition, okay? So generally what we do is we say, kind of these boundary conditions are only gonna be true for t strictly greater than zero to allow for situations like this, okay? That's on the observation as well, take a tiny step in time, how is your temperature changing? We want these to be satisfied. So like an infinitesimal step kind of into the future, the temperature at the boundary is going to jump from a hundred down to zero, okay? um, which you know, already is an interesting sort of um, maybe, mathematical um, aspect or, or feature, physically, we wouldn't expect initial conditions to be this kind of, um, to, to have this form, right? It'll be the initial condition that we might actually have in practice is gonna be a smooth version of this where it might be something like, so the initial condition would be something like, so temperature zero there, temperature zero there, and then like shoot right up, like nearly a hundred rounded edges, 
and then shoot right back down, something like that, as opposed to if we just had a constant, right? something like that. Okay. But whatever. So here we're going to treat this kind of mathematically. We're going to say here's our setup heat equation, homogeneous boundary condition or zero temperature boundary conditions, initial condition. Uh, what is the solution U? So for the setup, we know that U has to take this form, right? U is going to have these exponential pieces in time. It's going to have these sine pieces in space. And it's going to have these coefficients B sub n. So our question is, what are the co coefficients B sub n um, so that this solution matches the initial condition? So recall that, um, right, kind of more broadly, we want these B sub n to satisfy uh, kind of this equation, right? Our initial condition is equal to a sum of these sine functions for all possible values x. Um, and so then, okay, using this expansion, how do we get these b sub n? Well, we integrate with respect to kind of these sign terms, isolate, solve. Um, the formula is right, b sub n is two over l times the integral from zero to l of our initial condition, f of x, times a sine function. Um, and so this we can evaluate. So 100 is a constant, pull it out. We have the integral from zero to L of sine of something times X. So integrate kind of reverse chain rule. Um, this function in here is the antiderivative of sine of N pi X over L, which you can check by differentiating this, right? Derivative of cosine is minus sine. So we're going to get that sine to cancel out. We're going to get a sine there times the derivative of the inside. Derivative of the inside is n pi over L times X. So we get the n pi over L out here. That's going to cancel with this L over n pi. So we end up with um, what we expected. So right, differentiate this, you end up with this, therefore, uh, this is the integral of this. And so now we just evaluate it at the endpoints. Um, so if we evaluate the endpoints, what we get is right, plug in zero here. Cosine of zero is one. Cosine of zero is one. So we have L over N pi minus the sum of L. So I may have a slight typo. Let me figure out what happened to some of these coefficients. Um, Yeah, so this should read so pull this uh, L over N pi, bring this out here, the L's are going to cancel, and then here we're left with 200 over n pi. There we go. And so in here, ignore this, right? We have um, cosine of m pi over l evaluate at zero. That's going to be one. Um, but that's, okay. So let me say it this way. Ignore this. We're evaluating this thing at l. Plug in L, we get cosine of n pi, okay? but we have a minus there. So we have minus cosine of n pi, and then minus this thing evaluated at zero. So we're gonna get plus cosine of n pi over L x evaluated at zero, which is one. 
And so then that's where we get this, this thing from. Um, and so, okay, so now the question is, what is this? Can we express this in a slightly condensed way? Um, and so in this case, yes, we can. And so depending on whether or not n, this integer here, even or odd, this whole expression is either going to be zero or 400 over n pi. Why is that? Right, where do we get this kind of um, alternative way of expressing it from? Well, if we draw a picture of cosine, so this is cosine of x. Okay. So when cosine, or so when uh, x is an even multiple of two pi, so when x is equal to zero or two pi or four pi, et cetera, cosine of x is gonna be equal to one. So when n is even, this whole thing is gonna be one. So we have one minus one is zero. So when n is zero, this whole expression is equal to zero. Otherwise, n is odd. So if n is equal to pi, three pi, five pi, et cetera, cosine of that is going to be negative one. So if we go back up here, so when n is odd, cosine of n pi is gonna be negative one. So you have one minus negative one, that's two. So we get 400 over n pi, um, 400 over n pi when n is odd. Okay. So just a slightly condensed, quicker, easier way to say um, what this whole expression is depending on n. Okay. So what does that tell us? Well, let's go back. What is our solution? Um, it's gonna look like this, All right? So here we're summing up over, um, so n equals one up to infinity, but we're only taking the terms where n is odd. And then we, we get an expression like this. So this is a solution. This is the solution to the heat equation where initial temperature is a constant 100. Um, so one question is, well, what if, you know, we didn't want to write it in this way where we have, right, we're specifying that n is odd. Um, you could write it alternatively where you're summing over all n. Um, so let me write it this way. So an equivalent way of writing this would be k equals one of 400 over 2k plus one pi. So now k is equal to, uh, let me do it like this. Let's start with k is equal to zero. K is equal to zero. So when k is equal to zero, 2k plus one is going to be equal to one. So we have the first odd number one. When k is equal to one, 2k plus one is equal to three. So we have the second uh, odd number three, et cetera. Um, but the point is that we're rewriting everything in terms of kind of explicitly saying 2k plus one pi over x e to the minus k 2k plus one pi over l squared t. We're explicitly saying, you know, here are what the odd numbers are so that we have this kind of unconstrained uh, summation versus this constrained summation. Here, these are equivalent. They describe the exact same function. It's just a slightly different way of writing each. Um, use what you're comfortable with. Okay. Um, so, but yeah, so this is our solution to the heat equation for a uniform temperature. Um, how do we make sense of this? Well, one way is we can just you know make these quick approximations. So instead of you know summing up a bunch of these terms, why not just take the first term, right? Um, sine of pi l over x. Right? So x equals zero up to x equals l. Sine of pi 
L over X approximately looks like this. Okay. Um, uh, 400, 400 over pi is approximately four thirds, which for our purposes is going to be approximately one. Okay. So 400 over pi times sine of pi over LX is approximately going to be kind of this profile here, which is close enough for this example to a uniform profile. Okay. So if you plug in zero here, this is going to go to one. So we're saying that 400 over pi um, sine of pi over L X is approximately 100 for all X. Key, key word is approximately. Okay. Um, so that would be an initial approximation. The approximation would get better as you let time flow. Um, but one way to maybe picture all of this is this kind of schematic, right? So here, so this is a theoretical initial temperature. Uh, this approximation right here might look something like that. Okay. And then the question is what's happening to this temperature profile as time goes on? Well, if you fix any point here, right? So up here, that means fix an X value, be constant. Question is what's happening in time? Well, if, if all of this is a fixed constant and then we let time vary, we're only going to get this exponential piece, right? So fix a point, look up, here's the initial temperature, let time increase. We're going to get kind of an exponential curve in that direction, um, right? Over here, maybe be a little sharper exponential, but um, get the idea. Right, so pictures like this are one way that we can visualize solutions. I think MATLAB calls them waterfall plots. Um, but the idea is that you kind of, uh, trace these profiles for um, various um, choices of X and T, right? As T increases, you have these different um, slices or snapshots. And so then you get a general sense on how uh, the temperature is evolving. Um, yeah, cool. So that's kind of, uh, that's our systematic way to solve a heat equation, right? So, right, going back up to the summary, right, here's our PDE. The main pieces for this problem are, well, the solution is gonna look something like this. All we need to do is figure out what these coefficients are. How we do that is by computing these integrals, okay? And that's kind of our systematic way to solve these kinds of heat equations.